Hi, this is going to be something of a short video, I hope, about the way the Bible depicts salvation. Okay? You're looking on screen at the book of Hebrews. I'm using the New um, International Version because for the book of Hebrews, that translation is more, is smoother, easier to understand. Okay? You're looking at in blue the way the Bible depicts salvation as an inheritance. Okay, we're going to go through this a little bit because I want you to see why it's talking this way. Promised eternal inheritance. That's actually twofold. First, salvation. That's the floor that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 3, which the book of Hebrews is talking back to here. And then also on top of that, the so-called rewards for whether for what the Holy Spirit produced in you, gold, silver, precious stones in 1 Corinthians 3. Or if there's nothing produced on top of your salvation, then it all gets burnt up. That's the wood, hay, and stubble in 1 Corinthians 3. See, because the writer of Hebrews is talking back to that. Salvation is an inheritance. Salvation, however, has several parts to it, just like any kind of inheritance. In other words, if your aunt died and she was really wealthy, she would have owned a house, she would have owned stocks, she would have owned furniture. So those are different parts of inheritances that in a will, because that's what this passage is talking about, in a will that she can will to give to a beneficiary. Okay? So salvation is an inheritance like that. It has a lot of what you might want to call subparagraphs, assets. My pastor liked to call it the portfolio of invisible assets. It's got a lot of assets in it, and therefore there are different uh, bequests that can be made in a will regarding an inheritance. In other words, let's say you have this wealthy aunt and she said, hi, um, and you pretend your name is John Doe. John Doe, I will to you my house, all the furniture in it, my, my collection of art, which is worth millions of dollars, and my stocks. Okay, well, she might have other property, but she isn't willing it to you. You see the point? But in God's inheritance, everybody gets the will of God. See, think of will like last will and testament here, okay? Because that's exactly the way the guy is talking about it here. Promised internal inheritance. That's a contract. The Bible is something we got to read because it's a contract. It's a contract governing what God will do for us, what he has done for us. It's got all kinds of different parts to it. And we need to learn what that is so that we can learn what is the inheritance we have. Okay, you believed in Christ, you now have an inheritance in him, but you don't know what it is. All right, for those who didn't believe in Christ, the call goes out high. God has made a, a will and covenant. Covenant is another word for contract. God has made a contract to give you a promised internal inheritance. Okay, just internal inheritance. Promise means the verb of, of him actually doing it. He's giving you an eternal inheritance. At the bottom, yes, you're saved from hell. But that's not all it is. And you've got to learn this book called the Bible in order to learn what the inheritance is, practice the inheritance so that you'll be ready, ready for it when you die. That's why we don't die immediately after we believe in Christ. It's an inheritance. You have to learn how to use it. Just like a king has a son. The son is supposed to be the next king. Well, but he has to learn what that is before he steps into his father's shoes. Okay? Christ died. See? Christ is a mediator. means he died for a new contract, new covenant, new testament. Okay? So that those who are called, called to inheritance, kaleo in Greek, may receive the promised eternal inheritance, starting with salvation, 1 Corinthians 3. Because now that he has died as a ransom for us, to set them, us, free from the sins committed under the first covenant, which was the Mosaic Law. So look, this is the key to the whole thing right here. 
In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. The one who made it is Christ. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died, meaning the new covenant covering church has it is born because Christ died. All right? It's, a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. In other words, church was not born while Christ was living. So all those replacement theologians have proved themselves to be idiots because the church was not born in Abram's tent. It wasn't born until after Christ died, specifically on Pentecost. Okay? It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why the first covenant was not put into effect without blood, meaning the animal sacrifices. You see the point? Salvation is an eternal inheritance that didn't go into effect until Christ died. That's why Ephesians 4, 8, and 9, he took all of the Old Testament saints with him. He went down to hell, preached to the spirits in prison, that's in Peter, and then took everybody who was in the component of hell called paradise back with him when at the ascension, that's Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. They didn't go to heaven until he died because a will is never enforced until the one, well, the one who makes it is living. Well, he's not living until he's on earth and he has to then die. And then he took everybody with him when he went up to heaven. So now we have to have a new covenant because the old one has been fulfilled by Christ, Romans 10, 4. Okay? I, I, I could take you to all these passages, but I'd rather you look them up so we stay on topic here. Salvation is an inheritance. If your aunt wills you all her property, okay, she's willing it to you because she wants to do that. It doesn't matter if you're good, you're bad, you're ugly, or anything. She, wa she wanted to do that. She willed it to you. Christ willed to pay for everybody. 1 John 2, 2. Whether we were good or bad or indifferent didn't matter. He willed to do that and he did it. Salvation is an inheritance. Now, inheritance law, therefore, is what you should be thinking when you look at this. Now, maybe you don't know anything about inheritance law because you've never inherited anything from anybody else. Okay, so I'm going to have to just sort of give you a quick quick understanding of it right now. In inheritance law, the person who makes the will and testament, Christ being depicted here is doing that, that person unilaterally chooses who is his beneficiary. Whatever that person's reasons are, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's his property, it's his choice, what he chooses to do with it. So if your aunt chose to give you her house and her artwork, that has nothing to do with how good or bad you are. That was your aunt's choice. That was your aunt's property. Your aunt made the decision and put it in a contract called a will and testament, last will and testament. Now, at that point, she dies. See, a will can never take effect while the person is living. She's dead. Christ is dead. She wills you to have certain amounts of her, certain kinds of her property. He wills you to have salvation and everything on top of it. But it's up to you now. See, this is the important thing. It's up to you now. As a beneficiary of an inheritance, you have the right to say no. It's called, The legal term today is called elect against the will. Put that phrase in quotes. You have the right to elect against the will of God. You have the right to elect against the will of Christ. You have the right to elect against what's highlighted in blue, your promised eternal inheritance. That right to elect against the will is blanket or particular. This is where we get the word particular redemption, probably. I and mean, I'm guessing about where the theologians got it. But in law, you have the right to elect against an inheritance entirely. That's called a blanket rejection. Okay, the lawyers have other terms for it too. Or you have a right to elect against particulars in the will of what's promised to you as beneficiary. In other words, let's say your aunt willed you her house and her artwork and her furniture. 
Let's say you don't want the artwork. You want the artwork instead to go to a charity. Okay? So then when the lawyers come to you for, you know, you're agreeing to the will, you say, well, I, I'm, I'm electing against the will of my aunt to the extent of the pictures, of the artwork. In which case, then the estate has the artwork. Okay, not you. It's forfeiting. You're forfeiting an inheritance you're entitled to by electing against the will on that particular. Are you with me on this? It's really important. Because we're, we're, we're telling the unbeliever the wrong story about salvation. Salvation is, as you see blue in, in blue on screen, it's an inheritance which the unbeliever can reject. Okay? They can say, well, I don't want to be saved. I don't believe in God. Okay, fine. Then that inheritance that's laid up for you since eternity past, you're not going to get it. That's the real issue here. It's not about being good or bad. God has an inheritance that he accomplished in Christ. All right? Right here. For everybody. That's 1 John 2, 2. Christ died for everybody. And he died it. He died for it. Okay? See, he's died as a ransom to set them free. That's also playing on Galatians. Okay? This is what is in store for every single human being ever born on this planet. But the human being as a beneficiary of a will has the right to reject it. Now the author of Hebrews isn't talking about that part of it here because he's just trying to explain why it's the New Covenant versus the Old Testament. But as a, as a beneficiary of an inheritance you can say, well I don't want the artwork. Or I don't want anything of my aunt's. Okay, then you won't get it. Understand that real clearly. If you never believe that Christ paid for your sins, you don't get this inheritance at all. None of it at all, period. So what's left? Hell. And do you see why hell is now therefore just? Because if you're refusing a richness of an inheritance like this, Life forever with God. You'll be forever happy. No more sorrow. No more tears. No more pain. No more death. And then there are other things that you can get in addition. If you refuse that, when you didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it, because Christ just flat did it for you 2,000 years ago, if you refuse that generosity, what kind of person are you? You know, it is true that only bad people go to hell. Because you have to be really bad to, re to turn this down. Sorry. This is worth a bazillion dollars to each person on the planet. All the money on the planet cannot buy you eternal life. All the money on the planet cannot buy you association with God. God is gorgeous. And he did this unilaterally. This is Isaiah 53, 12 stated in, you know, more modern format in the book of Hebrews. God the Father and God the Son just said, Hi, if you'll give yourself for a substitute for sin, are the Hebrew words in my bad American accent. He just flat, they just flat agreed that between the two of them. And here it is in blue on screen. It's an inheritance for you as beneficiary. You want it? Then believe Christ paid for your sins and you get it. You don't want it? Then don't believe. And what you're rejecting is this, an inheritance. Now, I don't know a single human being on this planet who would turn down an inheritance from a rich aunt or a rich uncle or a rich brother, sister, father, mother, spouse. And this is way richer than the inheritance you can get down here. So what kind of a person do you have to be to turn that wealth down? I don't know. Bad. So, there you go. Hell. So you don't go to hell because of anything moral you are or immoral you are. You go to hell because you refuse this, this inheritance. Period. Now, i got to close this out. Hopefully that's still working. I want to close this out. The writer of Hebrews is looking specifically at 1 Corinthians 3 when he talks about this. That's why you'll notice he's saying promised eternal inheritance. He's not using the key word salvation because he's not just talking about the thing that gets you out of hell. He's talking about everything on top of it. 
the reason why you're alive after you believe Christ paid for your sins is to learn Christ. The inheritance is, is Christ. His thinking. Not merely being saved from hell. That's gold, silver, precious stones in 1 Corinthians 3. All right, that's Isaiah 53, 12 in the Hebrew. Paul plays on this being Christ himself being the inheritance, his thinking in 1 Corinthians 2, which had preceded 1 Corinthians 3, and also in Romans 12, 1 through 3, and also in Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. I'm going to have to ask you to go look those up because I'm trying to make a point here. The inheritance is Christ. We are his inheritance given to him that we are people booty. Literally, that's what it says in Isaiah 53, 12. But he's our inheritance too. And actually Isaiah 53, 12 says the same thing. And Paul is playing back to it in Romans 12, 1 through 3. And I did web pages showing the acts of Jesus on all these things. So if you if you're confused, let me know, and I'll you know send you the links. But promised eternal inheritance. Remember, I said some some minutes ago. You can say yes, I'll accept my inheritance from my aunt, but I don't want the artwork. I don't you know she's willing me the house, the artwork, the furniture, the stocks and bonds. Okay, I don't want the artwork. I elect against the will of my aunt for the artwork. Well, you can elect against the will of Christ to inherit all of his thinking. Thinking is what makes you happy or unhappy. Nothing else. You can be poor as a church mouse. And if your thinking is, is like Christ, you'll be happy anyhow. You can be rich as Scarface. And if your thinking is like Scarface instead of like Christ, you won't be happy no matter what you own. It's the thinking that's the true riches that Christ is talking about in the Gospels. He was happy. Hebrews 12, too, which will later come up. He was happy to even go to the cross. In the English, they translated joy set before him, but it really should be translated something more like exhibited happiness. Okay, fine. Take either translation. He was happy on the cross. Hebrews 12, too. He was happy to suffer. How can you be happy to suffer? Depends on what you're thinking. I, I am happy to suffer for, you know, the hassle of doing the videos. To me, it's not a suffering or a sacrifice at all. I'm glad and, and grateful I can do it. If you like what you're doing, you don't count your suffering as suffering. He liked paying for our sins. That's the message of the cross. He liked doing it, Hebrews 12 too. So if you don't like your inheritance, you don't like some of the things God thinks, and you don't want to learn and live like that, then you're refusing parts of the inheritance on top of salvation. So guess what? You can't go to hell, but you know what? You can be in the lower parts of heaven, and you will not be as close to Christ as some of those who actually learned him versus you. Did you learn your rituals and your works and, and getting you know approbation from people? Then you chose to be close to the approbation from people. You, close, you chose to be close to your works. You chose to be close to your rituals. And you chose to be far away from Christ. So you'll be far away from Christ. But if you chose to learn his thinking, which means learning and living on Bible, see, the promised eternal inheritance is him. He inherits you and you inherit him. Okay, but when you inherit somebody, you learn how they think. You, you take care. Whatever you own, you take care of. Christ owns you and you own him. Okay, so what care are you taking to learn how he thinks? If none, then you're choosing to live far away from him. Two people can be sitting next to each other and their thinking is as far apart as it can be. If you're learning your works and you're learning people approbation and you're learning your rituals, you're not learning Christ. You might be doing it in his name, but it's not him. But if you're learning his thinking, which is the word of God, Old and New Testaments, both, not just one or the other, then you'll be close to him forever. And that's what ends with the crowning. That's the kingship thingy. That's the whole promised inheritance laid up for you in Christ Jesus. Do you want it all or only parts of it? Well, that's up to you.
But in any event, I hope I've made, I've made it clear that salvation is an inheritance. It's part of a whole package that God willed for you and me and every other human being, whoever was or ever will be born, from the moment of their physical birth. And the person who refuses Christ his whole life, refuses to believe his whole life that Christ paid for his sins, that person gets none of this inheritance. And what's left? Hell. A person who believed only some of it, believed Christ paid for his sins, so now he gets at least the salvation portion, but he doesn't want to you know, learn the rest, because the rest of it you have to learn. You have to learn to think like Christ, to have the inheritance. Well, then the person who only elected some of that, he's only going to get some of it, so he'll be low in heaven and far away from Christ. Being low or high in heaven by itself doesn't mean anything. What matters is how close do you get to being to Christ? He's got a human body forever. He's going to be on a circuit forever with those 144,000 Jewish evangelists from the tribulation. They become his personal entourage forever. So he's going to be running around the universe visiting all of his you know, kingdoms. And then the kings of those kingdoms, hopefully you or me, get to entertain him. Well, he'll be there close to us then during that time he visits. That's why I want to be a king. It's the only reason I want to be a king. Everything about kingship I hate, except that. I want to see him. I want to be close to him. And I just want to learn the sinking anyhow. So then if I become a king, when he comes to my kingdom, I get to entertain him. I'll get to be in the same room with him. Okay, but my peasants, they'll be lucky to see him wave, you know, 100 yards away. Like when the queen is on a walkabout and you got all those, you know, Queen of England when she does her walkabouts and you've got all those people in the back row of the crowd. They just get to see her walk. They don't get to talk to her. They don't get to touch her hand. They don't get to do nothing. They just, you know, see the top of her hat. I don't want that for my future. I want to be close to Christ, not far away. As close as I can get. Okay, so I want the whole inheritance. Do you? That's your decision. I can only speak for myself. So, do you understand? It's an inheritance. Salvation is the floor of the inheritance, 1 Corinthians 3. Atop that, gold, silver, precious stones, which is your thinking, which is what Christ's thinking gets into your head, 1 Corinthians 1, 5. His words in your words. The Holy Spirit alone can do that. That's why it's gold, silver, precious stones. Is that what you want? Then ask for it all. Go for it all. Learn and live on Bible day in and day out. When you're doing your email, when you're going to the bathroom, what Bible can I be thinking that makes this moment noble and worth living? Because surely it's not worth living just to eat or go to the bathroom. But you can be thinking Bible while you do that. Okay, what should I be thinking, Dad? Ask God, ask the ceiling, what should I be thinking? So now you're using your promised eternal inheritance and growing in it. Like Peter will say, grow with respect to your salvation. Is that what you want? It's what I want, baby. But what you want, it's up to you. Signing out.